March the 10th, 2013. Um, <clears throat> and I'm entitling this study a nonprofit organization. I'd like to start reading uh, for the prayer thought from um, Christian Patriotism by A.T. Jones, and I'm reading from page 21. It was the same story of Babylon, Assyria, and Egypt over again. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God, and as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, the arch-deceiver seduced them into idolatry, and from idolatry into monarchy, in order that he might gain supremacy over them, and by worldly influence entire them, or by force prohibit them from the service of God. It was to save them from all this that the Lord had said to them, The people shall dwell alone, and shall not be reckoned among the nations. So God wanted them to be uh, separate from all the nations. Okay? If they had remained faithful to this principle, there never would have been amongst Israel a state or a kingdom. Therefore, in announcing this principle, God intended forever that they should be completely separated from any such thing as a state or kingdom on the earth. And as when that word was spoken, they were the church. It is absolutely certain that in announcing that principle, God intended to teach them and all people forever that his plainly declared will is that there shall be a complete separation between his church and every state or kingdom on the earth, that there shall never be any connection between his religion and any state or kingdom in the world. Now this is not making the statement that he is not going to have his own kingdom in the world. But we, as God's people, are not to be connected with any other state or kingdom other than the church or the kingdom of God. As that people were then the church. And as the Lord said, they rejected him when they formed that state and kingdom, it is perfectly plain by the word of the Lord that whenever the church forms any connection with any state or kingdom on earth, in the very doing of it, she rejects God. When we confederate or join another state, whether it be a state of the union, or the United States, or any other country, potentate, or sovereignty. We are rejecting God. But it is impossible for the church ever to form any connection with any state except by the individual members of the church forming a connection with the state. Therefore, as the church in forming such connection rejects God, and as it is impossible to do this except by the individual members of the church, it is perfectly plain that the teaching of the word of God is that for members of the church to form connection with the state is to reject God. Did you hear that? If we as members of a church form a connection or confederate with the state, we are rejecting God. And from ancient time all this was written for the admonition of those upon whom the ends of the world are come. Will the people today be admonished by it? Okay, that is what I wanted to read as a prayer thought. We are counseled to not make any connection 
form any connection, form any confederacy with the state, because when we do, we reject God. Now, let's get into this study about a nonprofit organization. A nonprofit organization. We are counseled by inspiration to keep church and state separate. Our allegiance to our Creator should not be influenced or shared by no other power. We are counseled not to confederate with the state when it comes to organizing a church association. The General Association of Davidian Seventh day Adventists, Incorporated. This is the iPhone text log of my conversation with Brother Norman Archer, President of the General Association of Davidian Seventh day Adventists, Incorporated, during the month of February 2013. The question asked by Charles Face of Norman Archer was Did you use Victor Hoddup's original name as General Association of Davidian Seventh day Adventists by confederating with the state of Texas? to incorporate as a 501c3 nonprofit organization and name you as president, and thus disregarding the bylaws established by inspiration in the Leviticus. Consequently, by your actions and the actions of your incorporated officers, you leaders are in open defiance and apostasy to the Lord himself. Charles, do I have your correct email? I need to know if you received my last email. Brother, please do not take this lightly. There is a lot at stake. Norman Archer answered, no correction, I read it. Charles, if you read it, where do we go from here? For the greater good of our Lord's namesake and the Branch Davidians, Norman Archer, not too far. We have no reason to believe that you are a prophet of God. And what proof, other than being the president of an incorporated body, fraudulently using Victor Hoddle's legitimate DSDA name, makes you anyone to judge who is and who isn't sent of God? You certainly have no God-given credentials, just your self-appointment through the state. Say not a confederacy, revival, reformation, and reorganization under the Holy Spirit and the branch is your only hope to survive the fall of Assyria and her economic collapse. Repent. Tonight is Passover according to the Creator's calendar based on Answer Book 3, page 10 to 12, not the Gregorian calendar. The Pope resigned, Brother Archer, so should you. Let God's vicegerent lead his people into the kingdom. Let my people go, says the Lord, the branch, or you will receive the plagues of Babylon since you are partaking of her sins by incorporation and confederating with her through the state. Brother Archer, your mentor, Brother Edwards, was a false teacher, teaching you falsehood and giving you bad counsel. You have been deceived. You are sincere in your deception. But the branch wants to deliver you and separate you from that deception and pass over you without spewing you out. He would much rather deliver you from your cursed sin in taking the denominational name General Association of Davidian Seventh-day Adventists Incorporated. We are not to confederate with the state or incorporate under their laws. Repent and be set free. Today, February the 28th, 2013, is the 20 year memorial of the raid on New Mount Carmel and those that did not sigh and cry for the abominations being done by the leadership, Koresh, and his council. Consequently, the Davidian Branch Davidian Seventh day Adventists received the Ezekiel 9 slaughter. Fifty days later, as the purification of the abominable branches in the leadership. I can truly say that I am the true witness of these events, since I sighed and cried and protested 
what the leaders were allowing Koresh to get away with. I am now sighing and crying for the abominations that you, Brother Archer, and your executive council are attempting to get away with. Repent and reorganize under the branch and his anointed and appointed vicegerent, or you will suffer the consequences of your apostasy against the Lord himself, the branch, as Koresh and his executive council. When they rejected his counsel, and crucified Christ the Word afresh, and brought him to open shame before the whole world. I am inviting you to come and keep the Passover with me around the table of the Lord, so you and your family will be delivered from the scourge and pestilence that is about to be let loose on those in the leadership that are defying the Lord, who was sent by his Father to judge and purify his house. If you Waco Davidians are truly the genuine church, the house of God, then you will be first to be judged. 1 Peter 4 17, as were the Davidian, Branch Davidian, Seventh day Adventists. Now it is your turn, but you do not have to die, but rather live for him as he leads you through the Joshua of today. We begin our service after sundown this evening. Please come and put the blood of the branch on the doorpost of a circumcised and broken heart. Repent. Today is the last day the Pope is in office. I pray that it is your day of decision to resign from being the apostate leader as well. Brother Archer, you are the Archbishop of Davidia. Please resign. You, like VTH, VT Hadif, must decrease so that he, the branch, must increase. Brother Archer, you are a troubled soul. I will pray for you. That was a good reply. Finally, Brother Archer, I get an answer from you. Yes, I am a very troubled soul, and yes, you need to pray for me, but more so, you need to pray for yourself and those that you are leading into perdition with you. I am troubled for your soul and the souls of those that you are leading. When are you going to give me time to speak with you and with the Executive Council? I have been waiting for almost three years now. I say to you, people. I have a message for you from God. And what do you do? You just put me off and make fun of me. Have you no respect for the counsel of Ellen White and Brother Hodiff? At least they are the ones that say that we have to painstakingly listen to anyone that says they have a message from God. You are not respecting the counsel they wrote. You believe that you are not Laodiceans, but you are the ones that think you are increased with good and in need of nothing, no more truth and no more prophets. You are the ones that are worshiping at the tomb of Victor Hada. But the council says that you are all wrong when you think you are all right. That is the council of the true witness to the Laodiceans. And because you are part of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you are Laodiceans, super Laodiceans, since you are one notch up from SDA. So, Brother Archer, show me that you are at least interested and convene your council so that they can hear what I have to say. Because if you don't, you're going to hear what the people are saying about you and your fraudulent organization that is in league with the enemy. And the Lord cannot bless a fraudulent organization that is not organized according to the bylaws and will not be revived, reformed, or reorganized by his vicegerent, the man that he has appointed and anointed. 1 TG number 8. And Brother Archer replied, Which government document did you see my name as president? If it exists, it is without my knowledge. How am I preventing you 
from carrying out your prophetic role. Why don't you take the counsel of Gamaliel? Brother Archer, here's the document. The Office of the Secretary of State, Periodic Report, Nonprofit Corporation, the General Association of Davidian Seventh-day Adventists, and you can't see it very well, but it says incorporated there. You can see um, by the address of the corporation and the one who is named here, Norman Archer, the name of the representative agent or the registered agent is Norman Archer. So Norman Archer is the one that does all this uh, uh, filing. As you can see, this was filed November the 26th, 2012. That's last fall. This is before I had asked uh, if Brother Archer was the president of the association. So this was filed back in November. Uh, we should be able to uh, see from this that Brother Archer filed this way before I had asked him. Brother Hodif never used that name because he never incorporated. He knew that it was uh, not according to the bylaws and not according to God's will to incorporate with the state. In other words, ask the state if it's okay to be a church under God. That's what this means, folks. There's no other way around it. And this is what I'm trying to tell him. You incorporate it. You made a big blunder by incorporating. You shouldn't be incorporated because you're not under God. Well, we know they're not under God because they're doing everything the way they want to do it, not the way God wants it done. They're not even using the, the bylaws correctly. So what association are they? They're an apostate association in rebellion, fraudulent. And if they're collecting the tithe and they're saying they're the storehouse, they're lying to everybody. And all these people that are believing that and giving them the tithe and the offerings and everything, and going around teaching that they should be a part of that association to be right with God, it's a lie, a downright lie. So the church is not in the hands of God. They're in the hands of the enemy. Do you understand this? This is the main point that I'm trying to make here. Not if there's a, if there's a president and a vice president. Because this is more important. If you incorporated, you screwed the whole thing up. You're not of God. You're of the state. Does anyone not see that? The straight testimony of the true witness is so cutting and so severe, it must be true. Ben and Lois would never incorporate. They wouldn't do it. They, we were told to do it. They wouldn't do it. Because you have to keep church and state separate. If you don't keep church and state separate and you become an incorporated body or entity under the state, especially if you're a 501c3 non-profit, not for profit. Well, they don't have a profit. You, know, you understand what I'm saying? So they organized as a non-profit organization because God can't sanction it. He, they don't have a profit for a leader because God's church... God's organization, God's corporate body, has a prophet or a spiritual leader that he anoints and appoints. You see that? So yes, they are a non-profit organization. And they're acting like they are, they have a prophet or a, an anointed and appointed leader, and they don't. And here's, here's how they get around it, or they thought they were going to get around it. Brother Archer, if you can see here, named himself, first he was president, Norman Archer was president, that was his title. Then he went in, and I guarantee you he did this after I questioned him. And I told him, I looked at your 
documents of incorporation. And I sent him that on February the 28th, which was the, the 20th anniversary of the siege, the Ezekiel 9 slaughter. And I tried to tell him, look, on this anniversary, the Lord wants you to realize that 20 years ago, he began the Ezekiel 9 slaughter, the purification of the, the Davidian branch, Davidian Seventh-day Adventists, here in Waco on New Mount Carmel. And because it's the 20th anniversary, you need to know that it's a memorial, a memorial of what took place 20 years ago, purification. But the Lord's not finished. Just like the Brother Hadif says, well, the Second World War is not yet finished. The Lord's not ready, uh, not finished purifying the church. He has to finish it. And he has anointed and appointed a man, okay, who went through the Davidian, branch Davidian Seventh-day Adventist church and marked on the foreheads those that were sighing and crying for the abominations that were being done in the church. And he sighed and cried for the abominations that were being done by the executive council, that's the president and the executive council of the branch, or the Davidian branch, Davidian Seventh-day Adventist. And he told them in 1984 that they were going to receive the Ezekiel 9 slaughter if they didn't reorganize, if they didn't come under God and stop believing that Vernon Howell, as David Koresh, was the Lamb of Revelation 5 and 6. That it was an abomination. Because that's the Holy Spirit. That is the uh, Bride of Christ. The only one that can open the book. Why? Because she is the author of the book. So I told them that they were going to be judged now. It's time for them to be judged because they're claiming to be the Davidian Seventh-day Adventist group, the authentic one, because they own the old Mount Carmel property. So the Lord's going to, you're claiming this? Okay, this is what's going to happen to those that claim that. Judgment begins at the house of God. So you're claiming to be the house of God, right? Authentically? because you're in Waco and you have that old property, where well, you're going to be judged first. Amen? Judgment begins at the house of God. So if that's what you're claiming, Brother Archer, uh, you and your executive council, then you're going to be judged first. And the Lord started judging. But he doesn't want to slaughter them. Do you understand that? He wants them to repent. He wants them to be zealous, therefore, and repent. Because I think they're... Uh, sincere in the deception that they're in. They have no idea they made such a great blunder. So the Lord's going to tell them through his vice gerent, you made a huge blunder here. You've confederated with the state. The Lord can't bless it. You have to reorganize. Is that fair, Roland? To tell him what you did wrong. Now he wants you to reorganize and do it properly. Right, Ophelia? Yes. He doesn't, want to, he doesn't want to slaughter you like he did with Koresh. They were an example. But you have an opportunity to make things right with God, make things right with your fellow brethren, because the Lord can't bless you the way you're doing it, because you're in apostasy and you're in rebellion. Do you not see that? So he's trying to help you do what's right. Because he's here to impart the righteousness of Christ to us. So we have to do what, what would Christ do, you see? What would Jesus do in this situation? Well, he wouldn't be in this situation, I guarantee you. And because we are, because we're sinners, we're faulty human beings. And yes, they probably thought that they were doing the right thing and they just wanted to uh, restore, you know, uh, the old uh, broken down waste places. But they did it the wrong way. Because that wasn't God's program. 
Remember, he told Brother Hadov to sell all that he had and buy another field, the field that had a treasure in it. And uh, everyone wants to say, well, he died before he sold anything. He didn't sell anything. He didn't have to be the one. He gave the orders because he was dead. And he died anyway. So his organization became defunct, inoperable, as the organization that the Lord was using because he moved on. Didn't he do that when Luther uh, protested? Uh, Luther was the one that God was working through. But then when the uh, message of the Holy Spirit uh, and Knox came along, you know, the Presbyterian uh, church was, and they didn't progress with truth, they were left behind, right? And so on with all the steps in the Protestant Reformation, the Lord is the one that leads. He's on the cutting edge of truth. You understand that? He's not in the one that didn't accept present truth. He moves onward, doesn't he? Isn't that what it says? Okay. How in the world do we, uh, all of a sudden, when Brother Hadif dies, we go backwards and we go back and buy the property, you see, instead of progressing forward? That is not the way God does things. He progresses. And that's what you have in the Protestant Reformation. Every step was a progression closer and closer to the purified truth. And you notice there's a line across the top. Truth is progressive. Every step, you see, moving upwards, upwards. Even though you see these specks, it's still polluted bread. But the Lord has to give it to us the way he finds it polluted with man's private interpretation. He gives us that so that we can choose the good and refuse the evil as he gives us the truth. And so we progress with the truth as it is in him. And as we go forward, upward, see, these messages, see, the Lutherans stayed here. Then you had the Presbyterians, the Methodists, the Baptists, you see, First-day Adventists, Seventh-day Adventists, Davidian Seventh-day Adventists, Branch Davidian Seventh-day Adventists. They're not there on this chart, but they existed within the Advent movement. And then you had the Davidian branch, Davidian Seventh-day Adventist. Right here, just before the line, because this represents Ezekiel 9 slaughter, the purification in the church. And it says in 1 TG number 8, out of this Laodicean church, which is all of SDA, all of SDA, that's SDA, DSDA and BDSDA. Why? Because the genuine movement has three steps to it. Isaiah 11.1 1. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. You see that? So you can't stay behind. You have to progress forward. And what they did with General Association of Davidian Seventh-day Adventists is they went backwards and they had to re they wanted to rename and re uh, purchase Old Mount Carmel and have old the Old Mount Carmel name. Well, then you might as well have been just like the Lutherans. So you're not the cutting edge of truth. The Lord passed you by. The Lord passed you by. But the real problem here is is you went and did it anyway and you incorporated with the state. In other words, you confederated with the devil because he's the one that's in charge of the state, the world, governments. So you took the government of your church, your ministry, and you put it under that of Satan as a subcorporation. That's what you did, and that's the blunder. So you gave the church to the devil, and you've been protecting yourselves with the secular laws to prove that you are the genuine movement, and you're really not. You're fraudulent right from the get-go. And this is what I'm trying to get you to understand so that you can correct it. And you don't have to be slaughtered like David Koresh and company, corporation. So, Brother Archer, you went in by hand and stroke president out. In other words, if you were 
using the Leviticus as your protocol to organize the church. You did the same thing with God's bylaws. You went in and stroked out president and put yourself in as vice president. Because you're not supposed to do that according to the bylaws in God's organization. You're supposed to realize that he has chosen a president and that he is going to appoint the vice president, secretary, treasurer, and other members and officers of the organization, his corporate body. So you see, you can't hide what you did. It's right here. It's right in front of me. And it's going to be in front of everybody because this, this is going to be on the Internet so that anyone and everybody can look at it. And what you have to do, Brother Archer, and the officers, you need to confess your sin, repent, and come under the jurisdiction of God's vicegerent. That's what you have to do to get out of this. Because if you don't, then the Lord's going to deal with you. Not me. No. He's the one that's going to judge you. So, this was done after February the 28th of 2013. They went in and did this. And I'm going to show you probably which day they did it because it's stamped on the corrected or the nice, you know, looking form that doesn't have any of man's dung. So all these corrections on here are man's dung. So what we had here, Brother Archer, Norman Archer, basically named himself vice president by crossing this out, okay, where it said he was president, and he was asked whether he was president or not. And to hide the fact that he did name himself president, because when you incorporate, you have to have a president in the corporation. And according to the bylaws, the only way you can have a president is if the Lord names that president, not the state. So he got caught, so to speak, and he had to go and change it. So what he does, he goes and crosses it out, writes this in. And now if you look at what is dated, see this is dated on um, March the 4th, 2013. What's the date today? Today's the 10th. So when did he do this? Six days ago. So he went to Austin, Texas. When I sent him that letter on the 28th of February, okay, and I told him today's the memorial, and I basically told him you need, uh, the Lord is going to judge what you've done now, and if you don't do it right, he's going to expose you and show how you're in apostasy and how you've reorganized under the state instead of under God's bylaws, right? So he goes to hide this. And so he gets them to set up this nice looking, uh, you know, uh, here it's all scribbled on, right? And this was, this was done on November the 26th, 2012. Then he went and scribbled on it, and I believe he did that after the 28th, because he told me, you show me where this legal paper is that says I'm a president. Well, it's right here. And you even changed it yourself. And then you got them to do, draw this up, see, on March the 4th, 2013, which is six days ago. So then he writes me back and it says, you're wrong in saying that I am set up myself up as president. Was I wrong or was he trying to hide the fact? You see, you can't hide the truth. When the Lord wants to expose your lies, you can't hide. Okay? You can't hide it. So, here we have the evidence. He changed. Now, Norman Archer is vice president. See? All typed in very nice and neat by the Secretary of State of Texas. So, in other words, the Secretary of the State of Texas appointed him as the vice president. What the point is here is that we're not supposed to incorporate. 
with the state or confederate with the state. It doesn't matter whether he's president or vice president or just the, you know, the secretary or the treasurer. It doesn't matter. You're not supposed to do it under the incorporation laws of a nonprofit 501c3 corporation under the state. You're supposed to do it directly under God and his bylaws that we find in the Leviticus. And they didn't do it. So that makes this whole organization fraudulent in God's eyes. And that's what I'm trying to tell him. And he doesn't want to listen. You see? He doesn't want to listen. The fact that you say you reorganized fraudulently under the state of Texas with a vice president is keeping me from carrying out my prophetic role to reorganize according to the bylaws with a president appointed by God who will reorganize the purified church under the sovereign Lord not the state, and with the prophetic new name, the branch, the Lord, our righteousness. And if you incorporated so that you could own the property, then you had to incorporate under the state of Texas, and the corporation needed a president. And if you incorporated under the state, you are not under the divine order, nor do you have any divine credentials to be collecting tithes and declaring yourself the genuine Davidian Seventh-day Adventist movement, which was defunct or dis dissolved by the Lord himself since V.T. Howdeth died and his anointing died with him, as did the name General Association of Davidian Seventh-day Adventists. You have made a huge blunder and reorganized fraudulently. If you did not know any better, the Lord wants to forgive you. But you must decrease so he, the branch, might increase. Do the right thing, brother. That is what the righteousness of Christ is. Doing the right thing according to his will, and in this case, doing the right thing according to his bylaws. Now, this is what he answered me. Uh, you did not answer my direct question. I need a direct answer for me to understand where you are coming from. My direct answer is that I have seen your articles of incorporation as a non-profit, and in brackets, a non-profit, that they don't have a profit, organization, with the name General Association of Davidian Seventh-day Adventists Incorporated, with you, Norman W. Archer, as president, and it doesn't matter whether he's president or vice president, a vice president is still a president. You understand? And a vice president is supposed to be named by the president, according to God's protocol. Named and appointed by God. He was done by the state. The General Association of Davidian Seventh-day Adventists Incorporated has a location of Waco, Texas, with active officers Norman Archer, Myrna Hawthorne, Trevor Davis, Gloria DeCaris, Miguel Martin, and Lennox Wilson. A domestic nonprofit corporation incorporated on Wednesday, February the 24th, 1965, in the state of Tennessee, and is currently active. That's still on that document, by the way. So, are you going to tell me this is not you? This information is online, and you are not able to hide your sins. You can run, but you cannot hide from the Holy Spirit. Please do not lie to the Holy Spirit like Ananias and Sapphira did. Your blood is no longer on my shoulders. You have been warned. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, the Lord says. Now, he sent me a letter, an email, and I'm answering that email. And what I did was 
my answers are typed in his letter in blue type. This is what I got on March the 8th. And when did he uh, file that document? March the 4th. So eight days later, he comes and says, see, I'm not the president. After he changed it. I'm not the president. I'm the vice president. Well, you're still wrong because you incorporated. Whether you're president or vice president doesn't matter. That's not the point. Okay, so here we are, March 8, 2013. He did this at 10 p.m. in the evening. He sent it to me. So he was really, he had to be really um, uh, worried about this uh, because it's Sabbath, his Sabbath. And it's 10 p.m. at night. And he sends, that's when I got the, the email. Okay, and this is what he says to me. Be it therefore known that part of Mount Carmel property is being subdivided for high-class residences beginning at the old peach orchard near the Mount Carmel entrance. Now, what he's quoting here is symbolic code number 10, but he doesn't give you any reference. He just starts quoting it as if they're doing it right now. Okay. But this is what was written back in 1954 by Victor Hodov. And this is what he said he was doing with that same property that they bought after it was sold. Okay? And, of course, he's going to try to make a point here. And the point he's going to try to make is that Brother Hodov didn't sell anything before he died, as if that matters. When the fact is uh, they had to buy it back and if they had to buy it back, it was sold. Right? Okay. The wise do not consider it a gamble to sell all they have in order to make the kingdom their own. Now, this is what Brother Hodder is saying. He's saying that God's people, okay, the wise, the ones that are going along with the Lord's counsel, they don't think it's a gamble to sell everything they've got. So what's that implying? That he's about to sell or he has sold everything he's got. Or he's not a wise person, right? He doesn't have any wisdom. He's not a prophet. He's not uh, uh, inspired. No wisdom. So the wise do not consider it a gamble to sell all they have in order to make the kingdom their own. They know that they are getting a bargain that such an investment will make them rich, both the man that bought the field, and field in Hebrew means Carmel. As you can see this uh, definition from the Strong's Concordance, Carmel, the name of a hill, Carmel, a fruitful, plentiful field. Okay. Containing the great treasure. So there's a field, a Carmel, and I would say the new Mount Carmel, because that was old Mount Carmel that they're getting to sell. Sell all that you have. And by the field, bought, both the man that bought, is bought a uh, present tense or past tense. It's past tense. It's something that's already been done. They know that they are getting a bargain that such an investment will make them rich. In other words, they made the investment. They got a bargain when they bought the field. Both the man that bought the field containing the great treasure. Now, this is what I put in there. Brother Hodiff bought New Mount Carmel Center in Waco, not Elk, after Old Mount Carmel was sold. And if it was not sold, why did you buy it back? And the man who bought the pearl of great price sold everything as well. So there's two men here, one that bought the field and one that bought the pearl. So Ben Roden bought what was left of New Mount Carmel Center, 77.8 acres, after the private interpreters decided to question Brother Hodiff, Moses, and even Ben Roden, Joshua, who would lead the people of God into the kingdom of heaven on earth. See? They had to sell everything in order to close the deals. Now, what that says to me is both these men 
were told to do something by God, and they did it, and it meant that they had to give up everything that they had. Victor Hadoff had a, a ministry there. He had property. Uh, he had everything. He was building it up for years. But God said, sell it. Get rid of it. Brother Hadoff was being tested by the Lord to see if he was really listening to the Spirit of God or whether he was just another, you know, self-appointed private interpreter just like everybody else was. But he did what God asked him to do. And he sold it. And he bought something else. And he hid it. It says he hid the fact that it was bought and that it had a treasure in it. So when it's hidden, it means it's hidden. When God hides something, God knows where it is. It's been hidden. And no one else knows where it is, but God knows where it is. I am not surprised to not see any documentation or any piece of paper or any declaration by Victor Hadoff that says he sold it. But it did get sold. That's a historic fact. It did get sold. Or you people wouldn't have had to buy it back. Okay? And New Mount Carmel was bought. And it was a place where Florence Hadoff, who basically said Victor Hadoff named her before he died as the vice president to carry out what God had asked him to do without telling the executive council of the association. It was none of their business. It was his business between God and him. And God wanted to know if people were going to listen to him. Okay? And Brother Hadoff, even on his deathbed, had to listen to what God was saying. And he told him to make Florence Hadoff the vice president. Why? Because he already had a president in the wings. And he hadn't died yet. So he could, that's why he had to make her vice president, because only a, a president can, can name a vice president. And yes, they had a vice president, Wilson, but God was not going to use Wilson. He was going to use Florence, because she's bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. Bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. So, I believe she was given that privilege and that honor to carry on the work because Victor Hadoff died. Okay? It didn't mean she was anointed. and a, Well, she was a, appointed and anointed not as a prophet, but as one that is to do the work of a vice president because she had to sell Old Mount Carmel, finish selling Old Mount Carmel, and then buy New Mount Carmel. Why? For the kingdom. The kingdom. This is where they were going to receive the kingdom. Whether it was the kingdom or from this place they were going to receive the kingdom, it didn't matter. They sold all that they had to buy in order to make the kingdom their own. That's what it says here. To make the kingdom their own. Okay? They both had enough to buy what they had set their hearts on. That's what Brother Hodder said. They both. Now, why is he this other person that, uh, you know, buys the pearl? Because he was getting everyone ready for what was coming with Ben Roden. God will do nothing except he reveals his secret through his servants, the prophets. He used Victor Hodder before he died, just like John the Baptist before he died, named the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He named him, baptized him, you know. Victor Hodoff gave Ben Roden a lifetime membership card. And Lois Roden as well. A lifetime membership card. There's no question in my mind because I listen to what the Holy Spirit says. I don't have to see it written down on a piece of paper. If the God hid it, God hid it. If God revealed it, God's going to reveal it through the Holy Spirit. Do you understand? Because God will do nothing unless he reveals his secret through his servants, the prophets. 
So if Brother Hardiff kept it secret and hid, you see the fact that he bought the property and he did it through his wife, whom he named, okay, and told her she could do it. I guarantee you, Victor Hardiff came up here and saw this property before he died. He didn't do it sight unseen because it says a man, when he finds a field with a treasure in it, he saw it with his own eyes. And the Spirit told him, buy this field, Mount Carmel, new Mount Carmel, and sell old Mount Carmel. The wise do not consider it a gamble to sell all they have in order to make the kingdom their own. They know that they are getting a bargain, that such an investment will make them rich. Both the man that bought the field containing the great treasure and the man who bought the pearl of great price sold everything they had in order to close the deals. But even though it took everything, they both had enough to buy what they had set their hearts on. Their hearts on. What God asked them to do. They had enough to do it. But that's about it. Okay? Because the rest has to be done by those that come after. They did their part. We're going to do our part. Then who knows but the Lord that this heart-stirring example may soon turn into a sounding alarm and be followed by every faithful Davidian believer throughout the land. In other words, the Lord did it first through Brother Hodiff and his wife or the president and vice president of the association sell the excess then the whole and buy a whole other field another field, Mount Carmel, you see? And, and this is on a mountain, by the way. It's higher than old Mount Carmel. When you look from old Mount Carmel, you see new Mount Carmel, and it's higher. It's the higher place, okay? Outside the city that the Lord placed his name. They were waiting here for the chariot to come. And in 1959, when it didn't come and Ben Roden came, he came from Jerusalem, from Mount Zion, as it says in one, uh, Amos 1, verse 2. And he roared. The Lord roared from Mount Zion. He roared at the habitation of the shepherds, the shepherd's rod people. And he told them, sell all that you have. You see, if you sell all that you have, there's a treasure in this field. And you'll have the money to go to Israel and establish the kingdom of God there. Ben Roden came to tell them, that there was enough land granted by the Israeli government for 150,000 people to settle over in Israel. But it was going to cost them everything they had because they had to sell everything to buy the kingdom. That's what it says. And the treasure was the money they were going to get by selling it. And it was an investment because they were going to get more than they put in it. And it wasn't a gamble to sell what they had and buy something new because they would have gotten more money for it. You understand? Then who knows but the Lord that this heart-stirring example may soon turn into a sounding alarm and be followed by every faithful Davidian believer throughout the land. Even now, the Lord's example to raise funds by disposing of his possessions. That land was bought by second tithe. His possession is a loud cry to every Davidian to awake to the fact that he is privileged to join the campaign with faithful 
tithe and offering at first, and as the need at last to swell the funds by giving everything so that the work may be finished and the saints be gathered home. This is what Archer is going to ask me, okay? Because he's quoting this. And Brother Archer is saying, gathered home. What does gathered home mean? It means in the barn, in the kingdom of heaven, on earth, in the land of the Gentiles, USA, beginning at New Mount Carmel Center in Waco, Texas. That's what it means, home. It means putting the products of the harvest, which would be wheat and barley here, in the barn, home, putting them home. And the barn happens to be the church, purified, the kingdom of heaven on earth, okay, which would begin at New Mount Carmel Center. Not old Mount Carmel Center, because that was sold. And it was sold to buy New Mount Carmel so that they could be uh, gathered home. Home is not old Mount Carmel. It can't be. It was sold. How much of the land was sold when Brother Hodiff died? That's what Brother Archer asked me. First the excess, then the whole. All of Old Mount Carmel was to be sold because the Lord was to sell all that he had first as an example for, for all other believers. Doesn't that tell you that everything should be sold then, if God said so? And that he was going to be the example. In other words, it was going to happen. An example means it's something that somebody did. Right? If old Mount Carmel was all sold, then, then the Lord had it sold. And if he did it secretly so that nobody else would know about it, but Victor Hodiff and his wife, not the executive council. Because God knew what the executive council was up to already. When Florence said that he named her as the vice president, they denied it. Did they not? The Lord already knew that they, he couldn't trust them. He knew he couldn't trust the executive council. Because when Victor Hodiff named Lo, uh, Florence as his vice president, they didn't believe her, did they? And you can see all the reports and all the things that they did historic fact that they denied her and they reorganized. And they reorganized even after Brother Hodiff died and that name and movement was defunct. See, God had Sister Hodiff dissolve the association like it was supposed to be because Ben Roden came along. And he was the one that had to reorganize it under God's new president. Do you understand that? And yes, she sold everything. But Ben Roden was able to do and have enough money and to do what he what, what was put in his heart to do. And that's to buy the 77.8 acres that was left. That's all God had wanted. Left. 77.8 acres, so that Ben Roden would have the pearl, which is the kingdom. You see, we're, we're setting up the kingdom on that same spot right now. You understand? Does this make sense to you people? You see? Because you don't have any baggage. You don't have an agenda. You don't want to force your agenda over God's. That's why you can understand this. And the Holy Spirit's telling you, in your heart of hearts, that Victor Hod have hid this from everybody but Ben Roden. Ben Roden knew, and I know too, what happened. Why? Because the Holy Spirit tells us. God will do nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. And they're the only ones that are going to know, right? Not self-appointed private interpreters. They're the ones that are going to do everything wrong. And they're not going to be following the Lord. 
according to his bylaws. They're going to go and confederate with the state. That's what happened here. And they don't want to admit that they made the, hu uh, the greatest blunder that they could ever do. And they lost the church. They've lost the church. And I'm here to reclaim it on the Lord's behalf. He's going to give it to me because I have a right, because I'm doing what's right according to what God wants. And he's named and appointed me as the vice chair, not Norman Archer. And I'm giving Norman Archer a chance to repent and to quit trying to manipulate the facts, trying to manipulate them to make him look like he is not an apostate, a rebel, and he wants to control the work and not let the Holy Spirit control it. And now we've got proof, see? He's been lying and cheating and confederating. The church is in the hands of the enemy. And he sends his vice gerent to rescue. This is the last ditch effort, you see, for God's people to rescue the church from the hands of the enemy. But he's got to send his vice gerent because he's the only one that can do it. No other person can do it because he's not going to authorize anyone else. Where is home in the above statement? Elk or Palestine or heaven? Home, Brother Archer, is in the barn or kingdom of heaven on earth in the land of the Gentiles, the USA, beginning with New Mount Carmel Center in Waco, Texas. That's where it is. This is home. It's where he's placed his name, where he's placed his vicegerent, where he's cleansed the church, you see, and where he's gotten uh, rid of the iniquity of, of the land in one day. April the 19th, 1993. He got rid of the iniquity in the land in one day. He slaughtered old and young David Koresh, his executive council, and all those that called themselves his family, okay, that married him, and are his family. He got rid of them because it was an abomination. They were trying to take over God's kingdom, Mount Carmel, here. And now it has to be built on its own heap. He destroyed it and slaughtered them. How much of the land was sold when Brother Hadif died? First the excess, then the whole, all of Old Mount Carmel was to be sold because the Lord was to sell all that he had first as an example for all other believers. So it was sold, or it wouldn't have been an example. Am I right? God sold it, and he hid the fact that it was sold from the executive council because they had no right to sell it. Brother Hadif did, and he did it through Florence Hadif, who he appointed. Not the executive council. He appointed her to carry it out. That's the story, and I'm sticking to it. That's my story, and that's the Lord's story, and I'm sticking to that. Because I see that that's what the Lord did. Do you have a burden to reorganize the Davidian groups? Well, that was nice of him to ask me. Do you have a burden to reorganize the Davidian groups, plural? I have a burden to reorganize all Davidian associations into one pure church. As the Joshua of today, the highest official in the church, after the purification of the apostate leadership in the Davidian, branch Davidian Seventh-day Adventists, Laodicea, Another church emerges of which Joshua is in charge, not the angel or ministry of Laodicea. The Davidian Seventh-day Adventist movement is part of Laodicea. 1TG number 8. The Lord desires to reorganize his people into one assembly because that is how we are going to be able to stand the test and time of trouble which is soon to be upon us all. The Lord, through his vicegerent, is taking the reins of the church into his own hands through the Joshua of today and 
out of the hands of the leadership that will not cooperate with him and his Holy Spirit. That would be all vice presidents or presidents that have to go to the Secretary of State office and scribble out their name as president and put in vice president. That's you, Brother Archer, and we know you did it. We know you did it, and we know you've incorporated because the name, the denominational name that remains as a curse is incorporated, and that's what you did. You made it a curse. You not only made it a curse because you used it, and that was only supposed to be used by Brother Hadev, but you incorporated it. You confederated it with the state so that you could be named by that name. It's already been named. It's already been used. He will not go backwards. Look at the chart of Ezekiel 4. God steps forward. He doesn't step backwards. You step backwards. You backslid. What and where is God's true Davidian association? According to 1TG number 8, are you a Laodicean or Davidian, which... Inspiration tells you how the Lord is going to bring this revival, reformation, and great change, reorganization of his people into one assembly through the ministry of the Holy Spirit and through his anointed and appointed vicegerent, who alone has the garment change, the righteousness of Christ, and is working in right lines to bring about the revelation of the Holy Spirit. He's going to bring a revelation, a message about the Holy Spirit, the gender work and office of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, the Holy Spirit, the woman, represents the church. So he's going to bring a message in verity about the stone that is to be thrown by the Lord himself at the kingdoms of this world and the churches of this world. And Brother Archer, you're about to be stoned by that stone if you don't repent. And you can now, if you are a true Davidian, inspiration says, if you follow the Lord as he leads through the Joshua of today, not the Norman Archer, okay, but the Joshua of today, do you have a council of seven or more members? How are they elected? The Lord has anointed and appointed the president, Joshua, the highest official in the church, and he appoints his helpers. The Lord names my helpers, and I anoint them to engage in the work with me. Will you answer the call and be one of the seven with Joshua? Brother Archer, will you answer the call? The Lord himself would like to know. And the choice is yours. The Lord is giving you a chance to repent and to make things right, reorganize. Under his bylaws, not under the state of Texas. As a non-profit, an organization that doesn't have a profit. So the choice is yours, Brother Archer. And the Lord is willing to forgive. I'm willing to forgive and forget. And let's get on with God's work instead of trying to play, uh, you know, the leader. When, it, when you know that God is the only one that anoints and appoints the leader, even the vice president and the rest of the council. What is your mission? What program do you have to get the rod message to 20 million SDAs? This is what the spirit of prophecy says is going to happen. I bear the straight testimony of the true witness to the Laodiceans, which is so cutting and so severe it must be true. As the teacher of righteousness I am to bring the message of the fourth angel repeated one more time so that the righteousness of Christ can be imparted in verity upon God's people through the latter reign of truth, which brings the latter reign of power through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in a message of truth first, 
then in verity or in power. It's the same message that came in 1888 and hasn't been listened to yet. It's been repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated, and it will do its work of purification. But it's going to be repeated one more time. If it doesn't do its work of purification, the way the Lord is going to purify the church is to slaughter those that are increased with goods and in need of nothing, no more truth and no more prophets. That's the only way we're allowing him to purify the church. If we're not receiving the message of the hour, which brings the impartation of the righteousness of Christ, the one that does have present truth, if you're not going to listen to him because he has the straight testimony of the true witness, and it's to the Laodiceans, this 20 million SDAs that you're talking about, including all you Davidians and branch Davidians, if you're not willing to hear his straight testimony, then you're going to be slaughtered because that's the only way he can purify the church. If you don't repent, he's going to have a pure church. And if you don't repent, he's going to get rid of you, spew you out, and slaughter you. Do you understand this? Quit toying with God. He's already done it once here in Waco. Don't make fun of him. How long have you been in operation and what have you accomplished? I was anointed as Joshua at Passover 1990 on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, Israel. I was instrumental in sighing and crying for the abominations that were being perpetrated by the leadership in the Advent movement. The Lord had me judge the Davidian, Branch Davidian Seventh-day Adventist leadership in 1984 and again in 1990, which brought the Ezekiel 9 slaughter on David Koresh and his apostate executive council and their man-made gospel program in 1993. This is the 20-year memorial of the slaughter, and you and your executive council are being judged at this time. So be zealous, therefore, and repent. What is the type of your prophetic appointment? Well, I'm glad you think that I might have one. Thanks for asking. There are several types being fulfilled at this time. Number one, the type of Joshua, the son of Yosedek, as a high priest to finish the work of atonement. That beautiful prophecy in Zechariah chapters 3 and 6 about him whose name is the branch, Joshua or Jesus the son. Branch means son. Yahshua means Jesus. So Joshua the son, the man whose name is Branch, applies with peculiar force in the closing work of the atonement. And the atonement is the removal of sin through the impartation of the righteousness of Christ through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Removal of sin, corporate sin. They take the veil down. The veil is taken into the wilderness on the back of the scapegoat. That's what it's like in typology. Okay? So, what it's like in verity is the Holy Spirit dwelling in us because we allow her to. We're not listening to our own preconceived ideas, habits, and practices anymore. We're actually listening to the Holy Spirit, the spirit of prophecy, who the Lord desires to put in us. He bought us with a price. Our body's not our own. And he wants to put his spirit within us to compel us to walk in his ways and keep his statutes and judgments. So you see, if you are listening to the Holy Spirit and you are allowing the Lord to put impart his righteousness to you, he does that by putting her in your body temple. And you can't help but do what she says. Unless, of course, you're in rebellion. And in that case, he has to spew you out of his mouth. Number two, the type of Christ or the anointed one, the Emmanuel, who eats butter and honey and is able to choose the good and refuse the evil 
or personify and exemplify the righteousness of Christ as an individual born again and anointed by the Holy Spirit. Well, Joshua is supposed to be the first one to have the garment change, to have the impartation of the righteousness of Christ. So it says if he doesn't have it, then nobody else has it. Brother Archer, it's not for you to say whether I have it or not. The Lord says I have it, and it's for you to accept it. Because if you say I don't have it, you don't have it either. So that doesn't make you any more righteous than I am. It actually makes you self-righteous. Because you're not listening to what God's saying, that I have the righteousness because it's imparted to me first. But you're saying I don't have it because you think you're more righteous than I am. And you're not. The Lord says Joshua is the highest official in the church. And he has the garment change first. No one else. The, then there's number three, the type, the Zechariah interpreter or the teacher of righteousness. Because Joshua does have the garment change first. And he is the highest official in the church. Because the Lord takes the reins into his own hands and out of self-appointed or elected leaders, especially vice presidents, in Laodicea. That's why it says, out of this church, the Laodicean church, the SDA church, the DSDA church, the BDSDA church, the DBDSDA church, emerges another church of which Joshua is in charge because the Lord's taken the reins into his own hands and out of the hands of the leadership of Laodicea. Because he can't trust them. Look at what you've done. You've confederated with the state. How can he trust you and your executive council to do what he asks? When he asks you not to do that, and you do it anyway. And then you have the audacity to declare yourselves as the authentic Davidian movement. Where the storehouse is. Because you bought a piece of property that God sold. And didn't want it back. Number four. The type of the true witness to the Laodiceans. Or the SDA movement. Which includes SDA, DSDA, BDSDA, DBDSDA. I can't say that enough. you got to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. Because you people don't think that you are Laodiceans. You think the Seventh-day Adventist church is Laodicea. But you're not. And yet you call yourselves Davidian Seventh-day Adventists. And you believe that you're a part of Mother and you want to go and help Mother. Well, if you want to go and help Mother, you need to help the Holy Spirit get out of the mess you put her in because of your lies and your self-righteousness. Because it's the Holy Spirit that has to cover our sins until we learn what righteousness really is. And she says, this is the way, walk ye in it. And you listen to her. Instead of trying to do it your own way. I bear witness of the abominations being done in the house of God. I'm the one that's sighing and crying. I'm the true witness. I did it with David Koresh and his people and his executive council. And you saw how they were judged. The Lord's given you a window of opportunity of 20 years. You were here in Waco 20 years ago, Brother Archer. Because that's when you guys bought the property and you tried to reorganize. You didn't think to ask questions of what God was doing with New Mount Carmel at the time. You ran from what God was doing at New Mount Carmel at that time. Because you were afraid. You better be afraid. Because God's about to judge you again. All you have to do, Brother Archer, is repent and reorganize. That's all the Lord's asking you to do. And you may even remain as vice president. But I have to name you vice president and anoint you as such. And you have to come under my leadership and the leadership of the Holy Spirit, the anointing, or you're not going to be a vice president unless you repent. Those who had the most light but rejected his warnings and entreaties to repent and give up their 
self-appointed positions and allow the Lord to reign supreme through his Holy Spirit and his vicegerent. That's what you all have to do. And please don't mock God by laughing and making fun because the Lord's going to hold you accountable because I know what you're doing behind the Lord's back. I know what you do. I've watched you. I've watched you. You laugh. That's what it says they do to this angel that joins the, four, the third angel. They ridicule, reject, and make fun of. That's what they do. So you're no better. See, and when I see you do that, I know you have the spirit of Antichrist because it's telling me that these people don't know what you're talking about. They don't have the spirit of God because they're going to ridicule, reject, and make fun of. And that's what you guys do when I come down to Davidia and I try to fellowship with you, try to bring you some truth in that hellhole you call Davidia. You're in apostasy. And finally, number five, the type of Joseph, despised and rejected by his brothers, but is able to reconcile with them and manages to save them from the tribulation or Jacob's time of trouble and was able to feed them spiritual food in time of drought and famine. Yes, you call this place the despised place. And I know I'm despised by you guys, but I am your brother. I'm a branch Davidian. And you wait and see what's going to happen. I'm going to be in and you're going to be out. That's what Ben Roden said to the Davidians that wouldn't listen to him. And he was right. But I don't want you to perish because you have nothing to eat and there's famine in the land. What you guys are eating, you know, trying to live on are the husks of the past and there's no nutrition in them. And you're going to end up starving to death because you have no spiritual food. It can only come through the Zechariah interpreter. It can only come through the Joseph that the Lord makes ruler he made him ruler over Egypt, over the world. Why? Because he was chosen. And even Pharaoh, the god of this world, the king of this world, let him rule. And yes, the one world order, there's going to be this Pharaoh, this king of the one world order. But Joseph is the one that's going to rule the world on behalf of the Lord. Not Obama or anyone else whoever you may think it's going to be. Joseph is going to rule because the Lord is going to make the kingdoms of this world the kingdoms of our Lord, his Lord, and his Christ, his anointed. So when you look at that image that's hit by in the feet, know that that's Joshua, Joseph, that it's his kingdom that's going to bring down Babylon the Great. If you're a part of Babylon because you incorporated with Babylon, then you're going down. Do you understand? You're going down because you're, you, you've incorporated. You're a part of Babylon. Where do you place yourself on the Zechariah 4 chart? Let me explain it, first of all, by showing you the Ezekiel 4 chart, where I am placed in the Zechariah or the Ezekiel 4 is right here. This is the line that demarcates the Ezekiel 9, the church before it's purified, the church after it's purified. And it says, out of the Laodicean church emerges another church of which Joshua is in charge. I'm in charge of the church the stone church, this church that's cut without hands because the Lord anoints and appoints it. It's not a part of these that are in the Protestant Reformation. And you Davidians are right here. 
and the branch Davidians are next to you. And the Davidian branch Davidian Seventh-day Adventists are next to you. Uh, we don't have any Davidian or Seventh-day Adventist in our name because we're not a part of that. We've gone through the Ezekiel 9 slaughter, and you know we have. And the church that emerges out of that church is this church here, of which Joshua is in charge, not the angel or the leadership or the ministry of the church of Laodicea. So you, Brother Archer, are a part of the church of Laodicea. So what the Lord has done is transcended and superseded your leadership. Why? Because of the purification. What purification? The Ezekiel 9 slaughter that happened here at Mount Carmel. Why? Because the one that was actually judging them, sighing and crying, was Joshua, the one that the Lord anointed and appointed. And he's the last man left standing, so he has to reorganize, start all over again. And he organizes under the Lord's bylaws on the land that the Lord bought for this very purpose. It's the Mount Carmel that has the pearl in it, the pearl of great price. And you see, in order to be a part of this church, this stone kingdom or pearl, you see, you have to give everything you've got. All your preconceived ideas, habits, and practices. You have to give up all your membership if you're in any of these denominations. Even Roman Catholicism. You have to give it all up to become a part of this kingdom. That's what the line's all about, you see. Because what the Lord's trying to restore is what he had here. A pure church, a pure apostolic church. With the Holy Spirit in charge, not man or men. So, Brother Archer, please, you must decrease so that the Holy Spirit, the Anointed One, the Christ, can increase and be in charge of the work. And you can't tell the Holy Spirit what to do. You're trying to, but if you do try to tell her what to do, you're going to have the same punishment or judgment that David Koresh had who claimed to be the Lamb of God the Holy Spirit, the only one that can open the book. The one that has seven eyes, perfect vision, seven horns, that represents the complete authority. You're trying to take, you're trying to usurp authority from her and is the complete spirit of God that was sent into the earth. So she's here to be the head of the church. And if you're trying to be the head of the church, whether you're a vice president or a president, it doesn't matter. Uh, you're trying to take her place, especially if she hasn't anointed you or appointed you. So you need to repent. You need to repent. Okay. Since the purification begins to take place in the house of God, 1993, with the Davidian, Branch Davidian Seventh-day Adventists, the third step of the genuine movement, Isaiah 11, 1, Jesse or SDA, the Rod, DSDA, and the Branch, BDSDA, Davidian, Branch Davidian Seventh-day Adventists. With the Ezekiel 9 slaughter, the Ezekiel 9 slaughter happened to the Davidian, Branch Davidian Seventh-day Adventists. They had that denominational name. Then the Lord has placed the remnant above the line of purification as the mustard seed beginning of the kingdom, growing as we choose the good and refuse the evil, while all the truth is gathered into one vessel and purified through the Emmanuel, the Joshua, the Zechariah interpreter, the teacher of righteousness, the highest official in the church, with the garment change, the righteousness of Christ. We are the stone church cut without hands, the branch, the Lord, our righteousness. 
taken from Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6, and 33, 15 and 16. Now you asked about Zechariah 4, and I gave you Ezekiel 4 first. Now I'm going to tell you where and what position I would possibly hold, okay, in this picture here of the church. Do uh, you see this tree here? And this tree here, uh, you have the Old and the New Testament. That's what inspiration says they would possibly be. Old and New Testament. But this conduit and this conduit are the means by which the oil is dispensed from the tree to the bowl. Okay? And there's two of them. You have to have two. I'm going to give you present truth, understanding, or interpretation of what this means. Because what you have is what is old truth with Victor Hodiff and Ellen White. That's old truth, okay? Uh, both individuals, Victor Hodiff, and Ellen White were dead, or are dead. So they can't be a living conduit through whom or through which uh, this oil can be put into the bowl, okay, which feeds the lamps, seven lights, okay. Uh, in other words, the oil has to come from the trees, and put into the bowl. Now, if you look at a conduit or a uh, that conduit as a branch and as connected to the tree, okay? Because a river is a branch. A conduit that uh, allows water to flow through it. See, flow means it's alive. It's not something that's dead. It's a living thing. The oil is flowing through this living person and this living person. So there has to be two living persons. Brother Hodiff and Ellen White were living, but they've died. And they have to be living at the same time, by the way. They can't be, uh, you know, one living and the other one dead. So the true representation of this are two living conduit or branches that are taking the oil from two different trees. Now, the tree represents Christ and the Holy Spirit, a male and a female. The conduit represents the voice of the bridegroom, and the other conduit represents the voice of the bride. The two representatives, the Joshua and the Zerubbabel, that are being used to spiritually and physically govern the kingdom or the church. One is a man, one is a woman. But they happen to be husband and wife which is a true representation of who these people should be. Not Victor Hollett, a Fennell and White, one dead and one alive, or they're not even married. These should be married, they're a couple, uh, they're alive, and they're both working at the head of the work. One is a spiritual leader, and the other one is bringing... It's just like Jones and Wagner. Jones brought the rules and the uh, understanding of how the kingdom should be set up. And Wagner brought the message of the righteousness of Christ. One was a civil and the other was a spiritual leader. And here, this is what you have here as well. You've got a religious leader who has uh, truth about the righteousness of Christ, the truth about the Holy Spirit. And then you have the other who is the governor, who is the governor of the kingdom, and who is going to bring forth 
uh, not only the truth, but actually is the governing individual of the kingdom so that you have both civil and religious authority and they're not confederated together. They're separate. They're still kept separate. And this is the true, you know, civil and religious authority. But what you have, Brother Archer, is you're under the civil authority and you don't have any spiritual authority. And that's what's wrong. So where do I put myself here as the spiritual leader and my helpmate, my helper, uh, the Zerubbabel, the governor, so to speak, because you have to have two that bring the genuine movement, the genuine revival and reformation. And that's my wife who has joined me in the work just like the Holy Spirit has joined Christ in the work. He went to heaven and did his priestly work and she came down here to do her work of purification and leading us into all truth. That's what we have so far with the light that we have. So where do I place myself? Where do I place myself in that chart? I just showed you. As one of the conduits that brings the oil from the bridegroom, so to speak. And my wife brings uh, the truth or the oil from the bride. And it all is poured into the, the golden bowl. Because the kingdom, you have to understand the kingdom is both civil and religious. We have real property here. Brother Hadif had real property. He had the message of the kingdom. And he had a, a kingdom. Okay? And when he died, he basically was announcing that the king was coming. The branch. The one that is truly uh, anointed of God to really and truly establish the kingdom. And that's what you have here. You can either... Take it or leave it. It doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. I'm telling you, that's what it is. And you can either believe it or not believe it. That's up to you. But the Lord is doing this, and he's done it. He's, he's, at, he's in the process of establishing the kingdom through Joshua and Zerubbabel. And we're told in the finality that Zerubbabel, the governor of the kingdom, is the Holy Spirit. So you have Christ and the Holy Spirit working together. The bride and the bridegroom working together. The third angel and the fourth angel working together. Now the fourth angel joins the third angel, the bridegroom, at the right time to give him power and force to give the loud cry. Well, you know, the midnight cry is, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. So it begins with the bridegroom, a message of the bridegroom. And it swells into the loud cry, Come out of her, my people, partake not of her sins, receive not of her plagues. See, it swells into a loud cry for the kingdom. The Holy Spirit bringing all the people out of Babylon because Babylon is the false woman. The true woman is the bride of Christ, the true church. So you have to have a bride and a bridegroom representing the bride and the bridegroom. A husband and a wife. Two of the same family. That's what makes it real. That's what makes it authentic. That's what makes it the Melchizedek priesthood being restored. What Adam and Eve had in the beginning was the Melchizedek priesthood, not the Levitical. You have a husband and a wife, a man and a woman working together in unity, under God, the divine institution of marriage. All divine institutions are going to be restored, see, including the kingdom including the kingdom. So let's go back and we'll read on. I hope that satisfies your curiosity. Here is the Rod's warning to you. So uh, Brother Archer is warning me through the Rod. Okay? In other words, the writings of uh, Brother Hadif. And here is the Lord's warning to you. Not the rods, but the lords. Okay, there's a difference. Uh, the rod is appointed by the Lord. Hear ye the rod and who hath appointed it? I'm telling you, Brother Archer, the Lord himself is warning you. 
you are not Moses, but you could very well be the self-appointed interpreters that are questioning God's appointed deliverer, Joseph or Joshua, and vice Jared. Brother Hadith, Moses, because they believe that Brother Hadith represented Moses. Am I right? Well, Moses is dead. Moses was dead. He didn't go into the kingdom because he died. Yes, he was resurrected and taken to heaven, but that's got nothing to do with this typology. The typology is that Moses died. Why did he die? Because he got angry with the Lord and smote the rock when he wasn't supposed to smite it. He was just supposed to speak to it. You understand? Because the, the rock represented Christ. So we weren't supposed to smite the rock. We weren't supposed to smite Christ. We weren't supposed to crucify him twice, the first time 2,000 years ago, and then again now, you see, through the leadership, rejecting the word, just like Ben Roden said, and Victor Hodef said, that the leaders of the church in Judah, DSDA, were going to crucify the Lord afresh by rejecting his message, the word, the message. What message? The message of the fourth angel joining the third angel. The message of the fourth angel, the fourth member of the Godhead. You see? The daughter. That, that's what they, you know, they reject and they ridicule and make fun of. Oh, the daughter. Oh, you're crazy. No, I'm not crazy. God has a daughter. She came forth from the Son, and she did it at the cross. When he said, Father, into your hands I give you my spirit. And he bowed his head and he gave up the Holy Ghost. And the veil in the temple was ripped in two from top to bottom. And the veil signified his flesh. So when that veil was ripped in two from top to bottom and you looked into the most holy place, do you want to know what they saw in there? Nothing. The ark was not in there. The mercy seat was not in there. The Shekinah glory was not in there. Then what were they worshiping? Nothing. Nothing. Just like you're trying to worship, you see, your sacred cow at Old Mount Carmel when there's nothing there of the Spirit. It's all your man-made gospel program. Your golden calf. And the Lord says, get rid of it. Get rid of it. And worship the Holy Spirit. The one that's really sitting on the mercy seat. You see? That's what you need to be doing. The spirit of prophecy. So, Moses is dead and gone, but Joshua is here to lead the remnant of God's people from the wilderness, the land of the Gentiles, into the promised land, the kingdom. It starts here first, and then we go there. Did they not have a kingdom in the wilderness when he brought them out of Egypt? Yes. They had a cloud by day and a fire by night. They had the kingdom. Don't you understand? But they were in the wilderness. They weren't in the land yet. So we do have a kingdom, and we have a, according to type, we do have a kingdom in the wilderness. And Joshua, after, uh, after uh, uh, Moses died, Joshua was able to lead the people through the wilderness and into the kingdom. Isn't that the type? If you have no type, then you have no truth. The famous Davidian line. You know that Moses or Howdeth and all those that left Egypt, SDA, did not make it into the land because of their murmuring and complaining. Especially about how God was leading them through his chosen leaders. First, 
Moses, then Joshua. That whole generation that left Egypt did not cross over to the kingdom except for their children, Joshua and Caleb. Those are the only two that left Egypt that remained alive to go into the kingdom. The rest of them died and only their children lived. Why? Because they murmured and complained. Now what the Lord is trying to tell us is this. If you want to go into the kingdom without seeing death, that's being translated without seeing death, then you better follow as the Lord is leading to the Joshua of today. Because if you don't and you still want to be with Moses, then you're going to have to go through the grave like Moses did. If you want to be led by Moses, okay, or if you want to worship at the tomb of the dead prophets, Ellen White was also called Moses, right? But Victor Hodd of Morso was called Moses in his movement with the shepherd's rod. So if you want to be led by a dead man and read only what that dead man had to say and not have it interpreted by the Zechariah interpreter, which would be the Holy Spirit working through a man, the Joshua of today, and leading his people into the kingdom, then you're going to have to go through the grave because that's what Moses had to go through the grave and he didn't go into the kingdom. And yes, he was raised from the dead. So you will be raised from the dead and you will be saved. But you're not going to be translated without seeing death. Joshua, not Moses or Hadif, will lead the people into the kingdom. And you need, to be, you need to decide which generation you wish to be part of. Those that die in the wilderness or those that enter into the kingdom under the Joshua of today. And I took that out of Brother Hottest writings, <clears throat> 1 TG, number 8, where it tells all about this reorganization, <clears throat> the way God's going to do it. Now, this is what um, my answer was to these next uh, couple of statements, which are really Brother Hottest, uh being quoted, okay? 1 TG, 14. This is what he's quoting. So he's, he's coming after me and he's saying, uh, so you think you're the guy, right? And what he's accusing me of, he's the one that's doing it. He's, he's accusing me of the very thing that he's doing. He's accusing me of it. You are familiar with the fact that there was no ism, trouble, or division in Moses' day as long as Moses alone interpreted the word of God to the people. Well, that's what I'm trying to tell you, Brother Archer. But just as soon as Korah, Dathan, Abiram, and others aspired to Moses' office, ism trouble started. And the only remedy that even God himself could find was to cause the earth to open her mouth and to swallow the ism-breathing multitude, the self-appointed representatives of God. Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, you know, your fraudulent organization with a president, a treasurer, and a secretary, the Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, uh, who aspire to not even listen to Brother Hadif's counsel to organize according to the Leviticus uh, and want to be the self-appointed representatives of God. God is going to make a way. You better be careful uh, this is something that you're naming yourself, Brother Archer, that this is going to happen to me, okay? Uh, because you're claiming that I'm the ism-breathing multitude or that I'm part of the ism-breathing multitude, and the earth is going to swallow up the ism-breathing multitude. Have you thought that possibly this could happen to you since you've become a 501c3 Nonprofit organization under the incorporation laws of the state of Texas.
which means that you have elected to reject God. That's what Brother uh, A.T. Jones says, that when we confederate or we join the state, we reject God. So you've rejected God. You're in open rebellion. You're in apostasy. Just like Korah, Dathan, and Abiram were. And you're the vice president, treasurer, and secretary. You've got your own little uh, organization outside of God. You've incorporated. You better be careful because the earth may swallow you up. And it can happen two ways. There can be an earthquake, okay, here in Waco. Uh, and you may be on the fault line. Or the United States, which is the earth in prophecy, can swallow you up because you're a 501c3 organization. And they can take away your 501c3 status because you are a Christian organization. And in the very near future, they're not going to allow Christian organizations to function. First of all, the Assyrian could fall, and if the Assyrian falls, the bottom is going to fall out of the economy, the United States economy, English-speaking Protestant nations, and you won't be able to function. So, see, the earth can swallow you up real easily. There are different ways it could happen. So what you need to do is repent. Reorganize under God's vice gerent. And stop trying to do this your way. In our day, there is an even greater flood of private interpreters of the scriptures, the cause of today's isms. You have isms even in the Davidian movements. You guys can't get along because you're all trying to be the leaders. Self-appointed, ism-breathing multitude. And like I said, you are accusing me of this. Remember what God told Pharaoh through Moses he would name the last plague and it came out of his mouth so if this is what you want you see if this is what you want for the earth to swallow you up whether it be you know through you having to be dissolved because you can't function any longer or there's a literal earthquake and you lose your golden calf you know it goes under then some may learn to respect the office of the spirit of prophecy. And according to Revelation 12, 15, and 16, the Lord warns that he will again use a remedy similar to the ancient remedy against today's ism breeding flood. Then some may learn to respect the spirit of the office of the spirit of prophecy, the office of vicegerent. Let us now read of the fate of those who chose to continue walking in the sparks of their own kindling. Brother Archer, this describes what you are doing perfectly. Revelation 12:16. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Here we see that a similar remedy which causes isms to cease in Moses' day is again to be used to cause isms to cease in our day. The only means by which harmony can be restored among the fellow members in the church itself, as well as among the Christians in general. You better be careful that the shaking caused by the straight testimony of the true witness to the Laodiceans does not create an earthquake and swallow up your sacred cow, old Mount Carmel, your golden calf, and yourself appointed counsel with it. May we all see eye to eye and stop crucifying the Lord afresh is my fervent prayer. Joshua Ben David. I'd like to end with a prayer, if I may. Lord of hosts, we bless you and thank you. We know that you are calling us to repentance. Each and every one of us we need to put away our preconceived ideas, habits, and practices. We need to come into unity with the Spirit. We need to come into unity with one another. But that can only be accomplished if we are in unity with the Spirit ourselves as individuals. Forgive us, Lord, for we know not what we do. 
I pray for Brother Archer and the council with their man-made gospel program. They've incorporated with the state. They have elected to reject you and go along with a man-made gospel program. Please forgive them for they know not what they do. I pray that you will help them to see what they have done, to see that they have turned the church over to the enemy, that they are not under your jurisdiction, that they're under the laws of the state, the jurisdiction that Satan holds. Help them to make things right, to repent. Help them to give up all that they have. Help them to be willing to abandon everything that is keeping them out of the kingdom and that is not of you. Help them, Lord, to do this. Help them make this last-ditch effort to save the church from the hands of the enemy. Help them to sell all that they have, put away all that they have that they built with their own hands, their idols of silver and gold that they built with their own hands for a cent, and to reorganize according to the bylaws of the Leviticus, according to 1TG number 8, under the Joshua of today, the one that you have anointed and appointed, the highest official in the church that has emerged out of the Laodicean church the branch, the Lord our righteousness. I pray that they will take what they have heard to heart and that all Davidians, all branches, all Seventh-day Adventists worldwide will come together in unity of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And just as it says that there is a circle and within that circle a royal reigning power the Lord says he wants the Holy Spirit to be king and we know Lord that that circle is that circle that has all the truth in one vessel it's the leadership and you Lord say I want the Holy Spirit to be king in your midst that she rules and that you allow, allow her to be the governor of your body temples and the governor of the church may it be so is my prayer Amen I would like to post the documents of incorporation. Uh, they were sent to me by Eric Edstrom with Universal Publishing. I would like to thank him for sending them. I, I didn't ask him to. He volunteered it and I appreciate that. I also put up the URL uh, for the link of his um, study on 501c3 corporations how they are a knockout blow for all Davidians uh, in the future. I also want to thank him for allowing me to use the graphics. I didn't know whether they were his graphics or not, but I have a feeling they are. Uh, some of the charts that I used, the colored ones, uh, were done by him. He did an excellent job. So I'd like to thank him, and um, I would like to also say that um, the tone of my voice um, was intentional, but I also had problems with the sound. I didn't know that it was set up so high and so loud, so I had to go through and... Uh, corrected as best I could. There is a little distortion. There is a little bit of loudness still in it, but um, I am not going to apologize for what I said. 
it may have come across a little harsh, but the straight testimony of the true witness to the Laodiceans is so cutting and so severe. It must be true. So, thank you for listening. Uh, you can get in touch with me if you want any more information. My number is 254 716 5859. And the reason I'm doing this is because I want God's work to come together in one body of believers so that the devil uh, doesn't make us any weaker and he doesn't uh, ping us off one by one uh, because we want to do our own thing and we don't want to do what God's wanting us to do as a body, a corporate body of believers. Anyway, thank you for listening.